Hi, good afternoon. Let's follow Nepali time and start at 4.01, not Indian time, which we start at 4.20, Indian stretch. But welcome all to Brookings, India. It's a great pleasure to have you all of you uh, for what is all called a um, book seminar. What we do at a book seminar is basically we invite an author, scholar, policymaker who's written a book, a proper book. And this is a proper book, Sujeev. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we have that person present the book. And we followed up with a discussion with experts with different perspectives on that same book. And I think it's a cool, foggy, gray day outside. So in many ways, we are in the Himalayas already. It's cold outside. And we'll have Sujeev unleash the Vajra, the thunderstorm. We'll have a discussion. And hopefully, the, clear, the skies will be clear afterwards. And we'll have a great idea about the future of Nepal, the future of India-Nepal relations, the future of connectivity in the Himalayas. Um, but let me say two quick things, I think, just to introduce you a bit of why we're doing this. Uh, the first uh, reason why I immediately said yes to Sujeev when he approached me, not immediately, I was on a holiday in Goa, but <laughs> it took a week to get back to you, but I said yes for sure, is because, as you know, we've all been working a lot here at Brookings India on the neighborhood, on South Asia, on the subcontinent, on East South Asia, whatever you want to call it, on BBIN, on BIMSTEC, on SARC and on connectivity, which really has brought, I think, a new dynamic to this region, uh, a new interest in the region. And some of you may have heard it also, but I literally was given two minutes ago the first copy of our first publication of a new initiative we started. It's called the Samband Initiative, uh, and it's called India's Regional Connectivity Initiative, where we're trying to look at various dimensions of connectivity and integration in South Asia. It's going to be a small project, very small, with a team which has been growing now. I think we're five, six people. Uh, and we're going to measure and look at connectivity visually, empirically, through data. Across, we've identified some 50 different indicators. Uh, of course, trade, FDI, uh, but also tourism, students, um, a telecom, satellites, a, a variety of aspects, classic infrastructure of road and railway. We finished already electricity, water, um, a variety of indicators which we're bringing out in small briefs to basically assess where's India doing well, where's it not doing well, where's the region closer to each other, where's it not. Uh, and we hope to have you on this journey forward. But yeah, this is the first sort of publication. It'll be up online, I think, later today or tomorrow morning. And this is the first sort of concept paper which lays out the initiative and which explains why this neighborhood and, and this neighborhood and region is so important. Uh, Sujeev, I think uh, your book brings out very clearly that the region is changing. I think often we've looked at Nepal as a small, an old, a static, a landlocked country. Today Nepal has 30 million people. That's not a small country by any standard worldwide. Average age of 22, comparison India 27, Japan 47. So half the age, average age of Japan. More diverse, I would say, even than in India, if you look at the geography and the sense of diversity in terms of religions, ethnicities, lingu languages. Uh, it's a republic with a new constitution, uh, which went through a tough, bloody process of democratization, but has achieved, has come out stronger with a new, stable constitution, which is still a work in progress, but is there. High growth rate, 6 7%. I know, Chandan, you will contest that it is a good growth rate for India soon when we have our panel. but above India as of now, uh, that growth rate. It's reconnecting to the world. There are more flights to China than to India from Nepal. So, Jeev, you pointed out on your book. Uh, there's new shipping routes through India, new multimodal connectivity being uh, allowing Nepal, Nepali products to access Kolkata and Vizag. The first oil pipeline in the region was just inaugurated between India and Nepal. You have now 168 diplomatic relations between Nepal and 168 under other countries. Uh, these are 50 new in the last 10 years. So you basically increase your diplomatic relations by 50% in the last 10 years uh, uh, w worldwide. Um, you have a variety of initiatives. Let's not forget, Nepal is the host to the Secretariat of the SARC, of, of, of South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. It's also a member of the uh, uh, ADB, AIIB, part of BBIN, um, and in many ways at the heart of the Himalayas in more than one way. And that new centrality, I think, is what you're bringing us today in this book. Uh, Sujeev, you often like to call yourself CEO, the Chief Eternal Optimist. I think the book shows it very well because you speak about political instability, 12 PMs in 12 years. 
You speak about crony capitalism taking over the state. You speak about cartel printers and donor printers who have been making money from a new industry. Um, uh, you speak about the earthquake, of course, which has devastated your country. Uh, almost 10,000 people lost their lives in Nepal. You speak about the blockade, India-Nepal blockade, and the problems of 2015. And then on page 132, you have a subheading called, It Could Have Been Worse. So congratulations for your optimism. I think no one better than you to steer us ahead um, and uh, explain what you wanted to achieve with this book. Uh, I will recommend all of you to buy it and read it. Um, very good book, which gives you a broad tour of the table, I think, of what's happening in Nepal. Let me just quickly introduce you uh, properly, Sujeev, because you're a friend, but many people may not know you. Sujeev is the chairman of the Nepal Economic Forum, uh, founder, CEO of Bead Management Private Limited, um, international management consulting firm. Sujeev has extensive experience advising corporate clients across different sectors and countries for over 25 years. And he writes and speaks regularly on the business, economy, leadership, and management in Nepal and its surrounding region. So we'll do, Sujeev, I think you present your book for, say, 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll be glad to introduce the panel and the other experts. Sujeev, up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tino, for hosting this event and for you know, contextualizing the discourse today. Uh, yes, I've got a watch in front of me, so we'll try to see that I would do it in about, I would definitely cross 20 minutes. And the way I thought today just to share would be that uh, just to want to contextualize where I come from. You know, there's been introductions, but you know, where's my writing journey come from, from my previous books to now, where this journey is coming from. I'll talk about the two key themes I try to bring about in this book and why these themes are important. And then I would go briefly into the structure of the book. Uh, Tino has walked us through some of those areas, but I would just try to uh, expand on that and get into some of the key messaging. And I would be more than happy to take questions when we go back to the panel. So in terms of, you know, it's always important to see where you are coming from in when, you're, you know, when there's an author who's written. And um, so my writing journey began about 20 plus years ago with Kathmandu Post, there was a column called uh, Beyond Money I wrote, and then there's Himal had just turned, well, many of you who are familiar with Himal, Himalayan magazine, I just turned South Asian, and I wrote a column called Sarkonomi then, I used to write a regular column uh, there, and then I wrote under a, a pseudonym Orthobeat for Nepali Times for about 11 years, Akin now writes a column there, and uh, then I've been writing for Kathmandu Post for past eight, nine years, a regularly fortnightly column, and off late in, I've started also writing in the Nepali language. Um, so I write for Kantipur and also have a Nepali book behind me. So I'm not an economist, but an accidental economist because nobody was right on, on the economy. So I started writing you know, about the business environment. And uh, before starting BEAT, I was working for one of the largest business groups in Nepal where I spent 20 years and left as the group CEO. So there was a lot of uh, requirement of understanding the business, the politics, the uh, you know, socioeconomic dy dynamics. And that's where I got into writing. And then you know, got into writing compendium. State of Nepal was the first. Uh, compendium I contributed to, then there was a collection of my uh, you know, pieces, um, Beat Bites, and then I wrote Unleashing Nepal, which was 10 years ago, when there was an open moment like this, where Nepal, you know, sort of the, the Shah dynasty had come to an end, and as Nepal was grappling into the Constituent Assembly, and uh, the open moment we had uh, the current president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, who wrote the um, introduction to the book, you know, he came in as a consultant, you know, we talked about how failed states can become, you know, frontier investment destination. That really inspired me. And then, of course, uh, Gurshan Das, who wrote the foreword to the book, uh, I just read India Unbound and really got inspired to say that there should be a narrative on Nepal of a similar kind. So at that time, I'd just come out with Unleashing Nepal. I'd just come out of the corporate world. Um, I was looking at investments, management, and I thought that you need money to fix things. You need investments. You need you know, sort of money to do, get things right. And that's, that's what got pushed me. But then as I started learning in my consulting work and traveling to countries like Rwanda, it's been eight years I've been working uh, on assignments off and on and traveling to Southeast Asia and other parts of South Asia. I just realized that you know we always viewed Nepal as a small country, as Tino was saying. So as one of my friends used to say that small country, small problems, 
you know small children small problems bigger children bigger problems you know so it's not a small you know economy problem it's a bigger economy problem and we see that you know from currently it's about uh, if you look at it's about 34 billion gdp with uh, if you look at the ppp it's close to 80 billion dollars it's not a small economy at all and but then we have had more people more educated people we have more people with degrees phd's doctors engineers in the past 20 30 years but we see more garbage in the streets we see a litigious society developing and that's where i thought that maybe we need to have a new lens of looking at the economy and that's where i got into my two key themes is to say that a, we should look at societal transformation for economic transformation. It's important that society is transformed if we want to have economic transformation. So a whole chapter I devoted, and a lot of my Nepali writing especially has been about talking about small issues as to how do feudal issues, you know, feudal patriarchy continues. How, even if the Shah dynasty has gone, why so many of these new dynasties has emerged, you know. So that's where I focus on. And the other key theme I talk about is that, and which is very, you know, as the book says, it's a journey between India and China. If you look at 16th and 17th century, India and China formed uh, about 70% uh, of global GDP. And that was a prosperous country, and in between, Nepal was a very prosperous country. It was a link state uh, between these two countries. And let's not forget that Nepal was one of the oldest uh, nation states in South Asia. So 2040, come 2040, we are going to be in a similar situation where India and China is going to be 35% of global GDP. So Nepal has an opportunity. So that's the lens in which I talk about the book. So if I look at the structure, it's like the Unleashing Nepal. It's got three parts to the book. One is the past. Uh, then I look at the context. What are the issues? And then I look at the um, w what is it that we need to do, action on the ground. So in the past, when we look at uh, Nepal, and because of the writing around Nepal has always been by, you know, if it is international folks, and it has been people who, you know, travel from, you know, India generally uh, during the British India, there were people who hobnobbed with some of the royals, and then they wrote uh, you know, about uh, what they saw. And that's what really defined uh, Nepali you know, sort of uh, history. But then I go back to 879 CE, where the Nepal era begins. Uh, so from there, what's been the journey 800, 900 years, how Nepali architects went and built temples in Beijing. And you see that in the hutongs of Beijing. I call it the Bahas of Beijing. You see that. How, you know, how did that take place? And also, it is you know, important to look at, we had oral history in the Nyawa language, the, the community I belong to, which is a tibeto burma language. And the oral traditions got, you know, sort of, uh, it got stalled in the 240 years. So there's not much we read in the English language at that point of time. And suddenly, after 2008, after Nepal become a republic, you get to read a lot of those things. And a lot of those readings have come out. And so it's important to see how did the caste system proliferate? You know, how does, you know, how these were viewed by outsiders? You know, so that is very important, I see. And then we see the it's amazing transition of Nepal in 240 years. A dynasty comes in, and then after that, in between, we have Rana autocracy. Then in between, again, there goes back to the Shah, you know, sort of 30 years of Shah autocracy. Then we have multi-party democracy, back to, you know, sort of uh, uh, direct rule of the king. So we have seen permutation and combinations of every kind, where we have, you know, sort of uh, rebel Maoists coming in and becoming, running the government, and we have coalitions of all kinds. So we have actually experimented everything. And what are some of the lessons we've learned from it? And uh, also to see that how does history repeat itself? So when the Maoists came into power, they talked about how they wanted to do away with this the, the, the Shah dynasty. And they said, OK, we will do away with it. And in the end, they did manage to, you know, along with the political parties, take the king out. But in the end, today, you know, they are, they are again, you know, sort of propagating for the unifier of Nepal you know, as Prithvinar and Shah, you know, again, coming back to uh, sort of revering that dynasty. So it's also important to understand history in terms of to see that history perhaps repeat itself. But as Tino said, I looked at what has changed for the better, uh, what has changed, did not change, and what it has changed for the worse. But I've tried to put a uh, look at a sort of positivity in terms of learnings from the history to say how that can define our future. In terms of the context, I, what I have done with this book is that I've avoided talking about government and bureaucracy. There's no chapter on government or bureaucracy because that's the easiest thing to blame. And I think as we as Nepalese, we have just, that's been the easiest thing to do. You mess up and you blame the government. 
you know. And so rather than that, you know, we say that, you know, how do we focus on the world of, as Gina was saying, the cartelpreneurs and the donorpreneurs, you know, people who rent seek on cartels, rent seek on, you know, poverty brokering. And that's where uh, uh, I've tried to look at and explore. Because it's important to understand that it's the private sector that manages a lot of who gets into the government and who gets out of the government, who gets appointed and who doesn't get appointed. So these are groups that are managing these you know, sort of things behind. And let's not forget that if when you talk about uh, the donorpreneurs, 80% uh, of the NGOs in Nepal have party affiliations. So when we are funding an NGO and working in an NGO, it's actually a, an arm of a political party that is working. So these are some of the things I talk about. And then we talk about as to where is the ambition of the private sector lie in terms of quality, efficiency, professionalism. Is that the issue rather than trying to see where is the problem with the, with the government? And then also, the, as you know, uh, sort of uh, being discussed earlier, things have changed dramatically with migration in, you know, out of Nepal. And if you look at, uh, say, statistics of 2018, Nepalese spend $1.3 billion in, in education in Australia, $1.3 billion. And we've received $22.5 million of aid from Australia. Now, where does that? You know, I'm not trying to say this is make come, but then things have changed so dramatically over these years, and the same thing it goes to the large uh, other, you know, sort of uh, development partners in Nepal. So the world of remittances have changed. There's about eight billion dollars of remittances we receive. There's a lot of social issues around it, but also. It is a societal issue that mi migration, unlike described in many of the reports, is not a new phenomena. It's an 800-year phenomena where you know, my ancestors perhaps were in, uh, you know, in Tibet and in China. My dad was in Tibet. Uh, so you know, there's been, migration has been a part of our uh, you know, safe lifestyle. And if you look at the diversity visa that the United States government has, one million Nepalese apply each year, which means that one million are always ready. You know, able-bodied people are always ready to migrate. And we see that. You know, 100 years ago, for the, during the World War I and II, we saw that happening. So how do we look at these issues? In the context, uh, the other, uh, my favorite, I continuously talk about the capitalist welfare state, which I've been propagating for many years, and to say that Nepal has its own definitions of socialism and capitalism. Uh, in Nepal, if you are clean, you are seen to be capitalist. Socialism, today I was tweeting, has to be a bit dirty. You know, English is seen as capitalism. You know, so there's this different ways of looking at it. And, and the key thing is that communism in Nepal did not come from China. It came through Calcutta. So we need to understand that the Calcutta communism is what got proliferated in, 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 in Nepal. And so it, it brings its, its own you know, sort of baggage and challenges with it. Uh, when it comes to journey between India and China, which in the panel I think perhaps uh, we'll talk more, uh, is that uh, with India we share a very historical relation. And one of my uh, friends, a columnist, C.K. Lal, you know, he points out to say that, you know, India is like big brother who you keep on fighting with, and China is like that sweet cousin who comes with a lot of gifts, you know? Uh, so, so that's how he uh, tries to put it. And, and I think I really, you know, sort of, we never have issues with China, you know, as Chinese people, but definitely with you know, India, continuous uh, challenges. But then when we look at the, uh, the geopolitics, uh, China is only became a neighbor after it took over Tibet. Till then, Tibet was our automatic neighbor. So we need to understand that we did not really deal with China in the past. So it was with Tibet we used to deal with. And the larger Chinese interest uh, came after the 2015 earthquake. They started taking interest in Nepal. And definitely after the blockade, we saw you know, more interest. And with BRI uh, coming in very aggressively, that has changed a lot of the landscape out here. So we can talk about this in detail. Finally, in terms of the future uh, chapters, I talk about Vision 2030. It is something that I work with the Planning Commission to say that you know, Nepal needs six to eight billion dollars of investment every year to become a middle income country by 2030. And that has to come from foreign investments. So we have to change our mindset to get foreign investments, you know, which has been curtailed by these cartels who don't want to you know, allow international investment technology transfers to happen. Sectors have not changed, hydropower, agriculture, tourism, you know, services, and infrastructure. So those are things I talk about. And finally, in terms of a societal transformation, I see the transformation taking place 
everywhere across Nepal. Now we have 753 local units across Nepal. And if you look at it, I think it's, it's about how we put on the lenses of wealth creation rather than looking at poverty elevation. You know, we are continuously always looking at how do we elevate poverty and how do you build a 500 rupee homestay, but rather than thinking of how do you do a $500 resort. There are le lots of lessons, as I was talking earlier, about from countries like Rwanda, Singapore, you know, Cambodia and others we can use. And as Tino was uh, mentioning earlier, perhaps we missed out on the peace dividends, but we do have the opportunity of leverage our demographic dividends where you know, we have 50% of our population under 25 and 70% under 35. And if you look at what's happening in that space, so if you, today, if you do music in Nepal, and if you, you know, getting one million hits has become a sort of a you know, hygiene factor or table stake. So if you look at Nepal Idol, a reality show that happens, like Indian Idol here, the prize money, and the transactions around that is larger. The second edition was larger than what happened in India in the 10th edition. So that's the sort of the youth engagements at different uh, levels that take place. So I, in the key messaging I talk about is how do we question the small you know, sort of uh, things like uh, Tino was mentioning at the beginning, we'll start on Nepal time. In Nepal, a lot of events happen. At times I've been to events in uh, the parts of Nepal where there are more people on the stage than in the audience. You know, everybody going up there wearing, you know, uh, khada and, you know, scarves and all the formalities that go on. So, you know, so, so, and the role of the woman. So I always, there was an event I went to and there was this, always when there's a tray that's passing, it's the woman who's carrying the tray and the man is there putting on the khada or putting on the, you know, scarf. So these little societal behaviors, how do you, how do you change that? And that's what I've been trying to look at. If you look at the male child, where does that entitlement begin? You know, is that the entitlement begins at home? So these are some of those very small things I keep on looking at because there is a potential that we feel that it can only be achieved through recalibrating the small things to make the big impact. The potential also comes from the fact that we are at a great geographical location with great natural endowment and great set of people. I think Nepal's biggest asset, when people ask me what's our biggest asset, I always say it's our brand smile. You know, Nepalese you'll see, and that's what has kept us in the service industry very, you know, sort of uh, very competitive. You know, everybody, you know, even in the most distressful times. So you'll hear of stories when at the earthquake, when people went to help, uh, volunteers were asked what they would like to eat. You know, they went to help. They didn't know how to react. You know, I interacted with a lot. Of, so this brand smile is, you know, one of the, you know, sort of uh, biggest assets I feel we have. So to end, I would just like to read a paragraph from my introduction of the book. And so for those who know about the Vajra, so I think you're, most of you know, it's a, it's a, you know, sort of, this is what the Vajra is. I'm, uh, wearing this, somebody gifted this to me, and uh, it's in the cover of the page. So for me, the phrase unleashing the Vajra, I believe, will be used as a metaphor in the future where it will denote the unleashing of Nepal's potential between its two neighbors by hitching its wagon to their fast-moving engines. The Vajra can have different meanings for people of different faiths and beliefs. But for me, it is a symbol that denotes potential. It is also an assurance of a dream that cannot be put down due to the indestructible powers represented by the diamond, the dream of millions of Nepalis across the world. Finally, it is the irresistible force of the thunderbolt that will bring about positive transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Sujeev. I think you've taken us to the sky, into the limitless possibilities of Nepal, and it's wonderful uh, to hear. Uh, let's uh, bring it down a bit to reality and what's happening these days and what's constraining us and the problems and the views and different perspectives in particular from a wonderful panel we have here. It's a great pleasure to have, as a former Janeuite, uh, host another Janeuite, Professor Mahendra Lama. He's a senior professor in South Asian economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University and uh, India's nominee in the Eminent Persons Group, uh, which uh, came up with recommendations on revising the India-Nepal relationship. Uh, he's also a former member of the National Security Advisory Board of India. Professor Lama has authored over and edited over 15 books, and most recently, I think, a work on increasing regional connectivity between Northeast India and its various sort of Indian neighboring countries. He's also former Vice Chancellor of Sikkim University. Uh, to my extreme left, Chandan Sapkota. He's a senior fellow at the Nepal Economic Forum, which uh, uh, Sujeev leads. Uh, he also serves as an economist for the Asian Development Bank, 
uh, worked for the Asian Development Bank Nepal office uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C., and a consultant for numerous development agencies worldwide. Uh, and last but not least, and I'll give you the first answer to the question, but uh, uh, Akansha Shah, who's a columnist with the Nepali Times. Uh, she's a journalist and researcher based here in Delhi with more than 10 years of experience covering Nepal and its neighbors. I think more than 10 years, probably. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, is also a former scholar at the uh, uh, IDSA, the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, and the Observer Research Foundation and a former Delhi correspondent for two prestigious Nepali newspapers, the Republica and the Annapurna Post. Uh, Professor, with your permission, I'll go first to the lady, uh, to <coughs> Akansha Shah. Uh, and uh, to, uh, I'll just ask you, Akansha, I mean, just briefly from your vantage point here in Delhi, you've been here. Um, you know, how do you look at the potential of Nepal given what uh, we call the sort of this challenge or game for connectivity? And these days in Kathmandu, there's a fierce debate on uh, Nepal tilting too much to China and the BRI, tilting too much towards India, neighbors fir neighborhood first. There's a huge debate these days on the MCC grant from the United States of America on e electricity transmission lines as being some ploy to reduce Nepali independence. Uh, just your views from Delhi on how you see this playing out uh, in terms of the future. Okay. Um, I hope the mic is working. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm loud enough. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you very much. This has been a um, great initiative by Brookings, and uh, congratulations, Mr. Sujeev Shakir. It's a in, uh, I, I read the book. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> it's an insightful uh, book, um, a lot of out-of-the-box thinking, ruthless, ruthlessly honest on criticizing Nepali society, especially uh, the way we uh, behave, and uh, the societal transformation that you talk about, I think, is, is has come out like brilliantly in the book, and that for an economy to uh, do better, it is not only the resources, the, the money, and the skills that is important, but also the mindset and the habits of sure. people. And then uh, at, at, at places, it is a little far-fetched, but that is what he always tells us to dream big. So um, I think this is a great book, and you must be uh, congratulated. Thank you. Okay, as far as uh, uh, Nepal is concerned. Um, Nepal has been through a huge transformation. In terms of institutionalizing democracy, it is a relatively a new country. Um, India-Nepal relation in particular has seen huge turmoil, and many of us in this room are very uh, well aware, Ambassador K. Virajan is here. Um, 2015 was the turning point because of the uh, official blockade. Uh, there's been, uh, China has come into Nepal in a big way, like you, you've mentioned, you know. Um, and uh, Xi Jinping's uh, visit to Nepal in October 2019 has been a game changer. Uh, Nepal's relationship with China has moved from becoming a, um, uh, a comprehensive one to a very strategic um, uh, one. Um, many uh, agreements have been uh, signed. The focus is obviously on infrastructure development, um, growth, education, and everything that is uh, mentioned in, uh, in the book. So yes, uh, there has been a large dominant uh, China factor that is coming. But at the same time, uh, the US has also come in as a very important player in uh, Nepal. Um, there is an extremely um, controversial debate in Nepal right now surrounding the Millennium Challenge uh, corporate, uh, uh, um, MCC uh, uh, grant. Um, MCC uh, grant uh, uh, is actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, more to do with the uh, infrastructure development. There are only two specific projects that the MCC talks about right now. One is transmission line and um, uh, substations, and the other is the road, impro uh, ro road improvement. Well, a lot of uh, members of the uh, ruling uh, party uh, look at this as a, uh, a, a part of the uh, Indo-Pacific um, strategy of the U.S. And therefore, this has been a little controversial in Nepal. But uh, for me, as far as uh, you know, what I have seen, even in the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, what are the basic tenets of the Indo-Pacific strategy? I think it is more uh, to do with, again, infrastru infrastructure development. And uh, to look at it as, uh, as a... Uh, you know, as a strategy for a long-term 
uh, dominance is probably not the right way to look at but yes uh, it is uh, it is it is it is hotly debated so both china and um, uh, the us uh, are uh, present in nepal in in in, in a significant uh, way uh, now having said that uh, you know the question was very broad based but i'll still come back to india nepal relations from uh, the 2015 uh, turmoil we have now uh, come to a phase where uh, from outside it seems quite calm and uh, there's been a, a much focus on the delivery just today and I think today is a very good day to yeah, talk about yeah, India yeah, Nepal yeah. relations because uh, one of the integrated posts uh, ICP at the Biratnagar border yeah, has been handed over to Nepal some 50,000 uh, private households as part of the reconstruction after the earthquake has been handed over to Nepal in Gorkha and Nuwako districts. Uh, well, this is uh, this is a ve this is very uh, important because you know the emphasis on the delivery from the Indian side, which uh, has been there in the debates in Nepal, uh, um, is is it seems that uh, you know the Indian um, um, government is focusing on the delivery. This is extraordinary. Um, uh, that is one. Um, second is if I can just take one more minute and bring back to uh, this thing. Uh, a lot of things are dependent on the domestic politics in Nepal, you know, and, and maybe we can talk a little later on the, uh, you know, the foreign policy, but uh, uh, not everything is well on the domestic politics. Uh, a lot of engagement, Nepal's engagement with China and India, I feel will be dependent on what kind of foreign policy orientation we are going to have. There is probably not a, not much clarity on that, but uh, uh, the domestic politics and the foreign policy orientation will be very, very vital. Uh, about the uh, domestic uh, part, let me just quickly follow up with your country. I think uh, Sujeev has at some point in his book this idea, which is not going to be strange to you, but he says, um, uh, let me read, uh, India in many ways uh, you know, is sort of an electoral rallying cry inside Nepal and people use the anti-India sentiment constantly to rally political support and when you're in opposition you cry anti-India, when you're in government you, you change your view. Uh, how strong is that still? Has it become stronger? Is it weaker in your sense? And is it actually leading to a lot of protests or at least issues? Absolutely, that absolutely. The present government of KP Sharma Oli came to power so on the basis of, of anti-India yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, pl pl platform, um, and and in every election, this is an important uh, issue. But inside Nepal, and I have just travelled for three months within uh, Nepal, I think there are two kinds of political debates which are you know very very predominant. One is and which is obviously the majority view and also reflected by the um, uh, you know the overwhelming victory of the Communist Party in Nepal that uh, India is still probably viewed as an interfering power and therefore India should uh, probably focus on delivering more than, uh, um, than probably interfering in the political discourse of Nepal and uh, therefore the shift to the, uh, the economic uh, relationship. You know, if you look at the economic relationship between India and Nepal, if the, we've achieved great uh, strides. The railway projects are being delivered. There's also talk about inland waterways. The road upgradation and improvement projects have been hugely pushed from uh, both, the, both the sides. So there uh, we are doing well. But then at the same time, the, uh, the, the, um, you know, the debate which was there even uh, during the adoption of the constitution, uh, the 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 uh, you know the concerns of the minorities, uh, the Madhesis, the, uh, the the women, you know, uh, the the whole debate that uh, the constitution has been discriminatory to the minority community, it's still there and it's still uh, it's, it's it's still alive. So yes, there has been little of India, but at, at the same time, there's a significant group in Nepal which probably wants. Uh, a, a larger involvement of India. I mentioned, you mentioned many examples of, of delivery. I mentioned the oil pipeline, you mentioned yeah. the, uh, today's integrated uh, check post, second transmission line of energy being discussed and implemented. The postal road is facing a few roadblocks but is going ahead. Right. Uh, 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 finally, a new rail link is being, uh, two new rail links are being built. 
I was thinking also the access of Nepali products to these ports I'd mentioned in the beginning. So I think a more emphasis on delivery is actually going to solve many of these political, classic political issues. We're going to, going to stay. Uh, Pr Professor Lama, I'll, I'll turn to you um, in terms of, of, of your uh, views on the book. But in particular, I was intrigued by, I think, uh, Sujeev hosted you last year at the Himalayan Consensus uh, in Kathmandu. I think it was in uh, May or June 2019, Sujeev? March. 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 And you'd mentioned, can India make Nepal, Bhutan, and Bangladesh a part of its Act East policy, with the North Northeast region at, at its sort of heart? Maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, surely. Before that, uh, I would only like to mention about the uh, about Nepal's cross-border connectivity. Well, you know, essentially, Nepal has had three phases of connectivity with its neighboring countries. The first phase was 18th, 19th century, to a certain extent even 20th century, where it was a very connectivity essentially driven by pilgrimage, cross-border trade, and to a large extent nature, right? And it was a very soft power-based connectivity. <coughs> then you suddenly see the second phase in 1950s, 60s, 1780s, where it became a competitive uh, assistance-based connectivity. Uh, India has been a very, very comprehensive partner of Nepal as far as development and connectivity. The first airport, the first post office, the first road construction cross border, all were done by India. But you will suddenly see in 1960s, King Mahindra would consciously bring four uh, foreign policy issues into the conduct of uh, Nepal's development process. The first one being bring China from the north, second population transfer from the hills to the plains, third make Nepali currency a kind of a national currency across the country, and the fourth was establish east to west highway so that people from the west need not go to India in order to go to the uh, in order to go to the east part of Nepal. Now that brought such a huge competition in Nepal. Uh, you have projects like if India does uh, three one Rajpath linking India's plains land with Kathmandu, China does Kathmandu Kodari Highway. If China does Sunkoshi Hydro Project, India would do Trishuli and Tevikad. If China links Pokhara with Kathmandu with Prithvi Rajmark, India would link, link Pokhara with the plains land of India known as Sunoli Pokhara Siddharth Rajmark. If one does airport, the other does the ring road. So it used to be an absolutely one-to-one -one competition in Nepal, right? And uh, that brought uh, two, three very, very critical factors into the, into, into, in, in India-Nepal relations. For the first time, India said no to, no to Chinese projects in the plains land. Secondly, you will see China trying to cut down India's role as acutely as possible, you know, delinking, say for example, east-west highway, making a small connections uh, to, to at Narayan Gar to, to, to make India's Trivan Rajput uh, a kind of a redundant. So it, it was. And the third phase now is a very transforming phase precisely because both the, in this transforming phase there are very serious changes in Nepal domestically, you will find. First of course is you have friendly states in Nepal for the first time. Uh, secondly, you will see a large number of multiplicity of uh, uh, development partners in Nepal. I was just checking the figures and you'll be surprised that I saw that in case of in Nepal, there were hardly 37 NGO and NGOs and INGOs in 1987. Today it is more, more than 40,000 INGOs and NGOs in Nepal. That is that is what that means per million availability of ngos and i ngos is possibly the highest in nepal today right it's it, and it's a very very complex situation as far as this making process is concerned so india is essentially driven by as you rightly said a much much transforming uh, you know, foreign policy project like actis policy and chinese of course by the uh, uh, by the by the project like uh, like like uh, belt and road initiatives you know but you will find a striking difference in india's approach in actist policy and china's approach in 
Belt and Road Initiatives. China's Belt and Road Initiative is essentially driven by, uh, by what you call a kind of bringing the entire Asian region into the picture. Say for example, they have consistently followed what I call in my recent uh, articles, I say it is a kind of a, in Sanskrit we call it Trishul, Trishul approach, it is a trident. You know, first you have a local integration, then you have a national integration, and third you have a regional integration. Go to Central Asia, go to Southeast Asia, go to East Asia, and to South Asia, you will find absolutely the same pattern. In South Asia, including with Nepal, the local integration is through something like Tatopani border, mm. Kerung, right? Mm. Uh, with India, Natula, Shipkila, uh, and Lipulek, in, uh, right? And with uh, <laughs> Afghanistan, it is Wakhan Corridor, and with Pakistan, it is such a beautifully designed and a very consciously designed local integration. Secondly, a national integration, again, that means you really grab as far as trade and investment is concerned and technology is concerned. So today, most of South Asia's, over 25% of their world global trade, except India, of course, I think India's is about 19%, but most of them will have about more than 25% with China. This has never been the case. Two years, or 20 years back, it used to be hardly five, six, seven percent. So it is a very, and third is engage the regional institution, SARC, BB, BCIM, or a, a BIM state, RCEP, ASEAN, right, and CAREC in Central Asia. So you will find a pattern. But so how do we, how do they balance it? How does India balance these kind of cases? Because it is, it is such a comprehensive engagement, trying, uh, possibility engagement by, possibility of engagement by China. So for India, one of the very clear ways forward would be to really put the entire uh, Himalayan regions, right? Precisely because Chinese are now trying to uh, develop a kind of a distinct affinity with Buddhism and Himalayan regions. If you see, I, I happened to teach in China for the last two years, and I saw a very conscious policy on the government, on the part of the government of China to develop institutions related to Buddhism and to develop institutions related to Himalayan regions. Never been the case. Whereas our approach in India to the Himalayan regions is still traditional, largely orthodox in, in, our, in our thinking. So one of the ways forward is to really, you know, lock, stuck and barrel involved Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh in India's access policy because all these three states, all these three nations are looking forward to integrate with Southeast Asian countries. And that is where we think that it should be highly project driven, right? Uh, particularly the connectivity parts of it. And that would really going to, that is really going to address India's major concern as far as uh, security and foreign policy in Nepal is concerned. Professor, quick follow up. Where are the biggest challenges for this vision and objective in terms of India promoting greater connectivity in the region. Where do you see things going slow? Where can they go quicker? You've served in Sikkim also, also a border state. There's a lot of difficulties in reaching and building infrastructure in India and in border areas with other countries and beyond in other countries. For example. Yeah, I think uh, I would see that. Is it, is it economic insecurity also that, or is it uh, security issues? Is it a geopolitical vision still of China? You see, the first is we have not been able to blend uh, our vision of looking uh, of active policy with what do the neighbors really uh, would like to get out of it. We, there is a disconnect still, right? And I see. Secondly, our inability to really transform many of these projects. Say, for example, one of the major instruments of the active policy is the trilateral highway between uh, India, Myanmar, and Thailand. Where, this highway is still not completed. We have been talking about it. The, the, the multimodal, uh, the, the, the sea routes, right? In the Sitway port Kaladan. through Kaladan project. So I think what we have found increasingly is the institutions which we have had in the past to really take forward some of these transforming projects are not really able to cope up with what the, what, what the projects actually would like to get out of these institutions in terms of technology, in terms of techniques, in terms of knowledge, in terms of experimentations, right? Say, for example, 
we still have uh, an institution like Border Road Organizations, highly traditional in its character in terms of technology, technical inputs, entire road designs and all. So I think this requires, and whereas if you see a country like Korea, Japan, China, even to a large extent, even the US, doing road projects in, in neighboring countries, they have moved so fast with modern technologies, techniques, designs, right? All kinds of things. You, this is where I think uh, we have lagged, and we can see that happening even in within our own country, in the in the northeast part of region of India. But is everything chi as every Chinese infrastructure in India's immediate neighborhood a security threat for India, or is there where where issues more <laughs> acceptable? I would not say the. I would not think well. Securitization of projects have been consciously done by the Chinese, right? They have, in fact, several models. You see, I have the, they have a Djibouti model, they have a Mekong model, they have a Damascus model, they have uh, several models now as far as securities, whether they would like to use PLA or, uh, or the people's, uh, what is this, the PAA, or even the private sector, private securities, which is now a new uh, new actor in the new state actor in, in case China. of China, right? So each project has a serious security, uh, what you call it, dimension, right? But each project done by China, particularly in the neighboring countries of India, would also give India a tremendous degree of opportunity, right? To participate, to create a new constituency, to develop a new development dimension. Say, for example, uh, the, 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 uh, the internet facility in Nepal, right? The, the, the what do you call it, the cables, optic the, the optic fibers. India is doing in the east-west highway about 800 plus kilometers. The Chinese are doing from the north. What stops India to go up to Kero to do this kind of uh, projects? Because India has been one of the key development players in, uh, in Nepal. So this is where we have uh, the India as a kind of a nation has not been able to galvanized, mobilized all its institutional, human and technological and technical resources. Thank you, Professor. Chandan, uh, over to you. We spoke about optic fiber links. A good moment for you to come in. <laughs> as an economist and a rising economist in Nepal, uh, uh, I recommend all of you to read his blog. Chandan posts regularly on the uh, Nepal economy, on the Indian economy, and South Asian economic issues. A great post over there. But how do you see Nepal economically making choices for its development that will have geopolitical uh, you know, forks in the road? There will be tough choices, right? Yeah, I hear me, right? Yeah, I think um, in the last three years, uh, Nepal has been clocking above six percent growth, and some of it, some of it could be some of some of the factors could be a fluke, but there are certain underlying factors that really pushing growth, and those uh, come in with the institutions that, that the government was able to build. Uh, political stability has a huge role in ensuring domestic investors invest money in the country, what, whatever liquidity is available. Still, the foreign foreign investors are wait and see mode. Not not big projects have come in, except for some Chinese projects, um, just to the extent of commitments. So they have secured commitments from the government for certain projects. Uh, foreign investment is up to that part, but uh, domestic uh, domestically internal investors are investing. So industrial sector is going up, and that has partly to do with after the earthquake and the supply disruptions we had in 15-16. Uh, so a lot of base effect. And then, uh, and then some real effect too. So in that way, uh, the last three years, uh, above six percent growth is one of the fastest growing regions, in one of the fastest growing countries in South Asia. But that also brings a challenge in terms of how to sustain it. Right? Does Nepal have the capacity to sustain it in terms of the bureaucracy, institutions, and crucially financing? Now, if you go to financing, <coughs> uh, the government's uh, tax revenue is almost equal to recurrent spending. Uh, so in India, you call it uh, uh, regular spending. Uh, so that comes out directly from revenue. So, but then uh, government wants, the, but then the government wants the economy to grow. So you need to bring money from somewhere. So in that process, government is trying to borrow. And when it's borrowing, fiscal deficit is growing up. But how do you how do you balance these things uh, with the need of external financing? And there are certain players in Nepal where um, 
Uh, they have been traditionally like ADB, World Bank, which have been giving consistent lending. But that, tree, that too is drying up slowly because Nepal per capita income is going up. So they want to graduate Nepal to a, a, a blend of consistent and non-consistent lending. Beyond that, Nepal needs more. For example, right now, uh, the, ca the capital spending is around 6%, 5-6% of GDP. If you really want to plug the infrastructure gap, that's like eight, that's between, what we need is between 8 to 12% of GDP worth of funding in infrastructure, five or six infrastructure every year. So there's a huge gap. Where do you bring that? That's equivalent to almost like 1.5 to $2 billion extra money every year. So where do you bring that? And obviously, you, you look at India and China. Right? A lot of Indian investors, the largest investors in Nepal are, are Indians, largest tourists come from, a lot of tourists come from India. Uh, all these exchanges, trade, all these things happen, majority or mainly inclined to India. But then Chinese are slow, Chinese investment is slowly picking up. So these last two years, Chinese uh, commitments, not like actual investments, so commitments are actually larger than Indians, India wants. So Nepal is increasingly looking to Chinese BRI policy banks, what you call uh, among the BRI policy banks, you name it, any kind of development, each development uh, banks, China has AIIB, uh, China's Development Bank, Exim Bank, all these things come in. So they are increasingly making inroads and picking up big projects in Nepal. They do bidding and then the Chinese uh, investors somehow uh, tend to bid, uh, tend to underbid the project and secure the projects. And then, and then some of them are delivering, some of them are not delivering, and there is cost and time overruns. Same thing with the same story with Indian investors too, right? So no difference. So uh, in terms of Nepal's growth prospect, where it wants to grow, so the government says they want to grow around 10% in two years' time, but the reality is like above 6%. 6 is uh, ambitious, but maybe achievable. Sounds, sounds familiar. Yeah, six percent. Six percent is uh, kind of uh, sounds ambitious, but achievable if political stability is okay. But in order to achieve six percent, too, uh, going from like four point five percent average for the past ten years to go to six percent, it's a huge jump. And for that, you need more money from outside. So there's not much liquidity in the country. Government can spend too. Uh, revenue sources are drying up uh, for the government. So it has reached the um, it has reached its threshold in terms of. Uh, in terms of raising domestic revenue, you can't have you can't have year in your year and year twenty percent revenue growth every year. It's kind of not possible in a growing in a country in an economy like Nepal. And Nepal's tax to GDP ratio is almost is actually one of the highest among low income countries. I mean, it's it's twenty twenty seven percent of GDP uh, equivalent 24, 24, 25 percent of GDP equivalent of revenue that you are generating is huge for Nepal. And, and that Nepal has reached the threshold now, it's reaching the threshold, so you need external sources. So it, obviously it has to look sideways and China with a lot of money and a lot of ambition to launch big projects. They are not interested in small projects. Indian investors are interested in medium, large, small, all kinds of projects scattered all over. But Chinese really want to do big projects. Bodhi Gandaki, West Sethi. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't go, I mean, things haven't moved fast. But they want to secure the commitments and then see uh, where it goes. Right? And, um, and if you look at uh, recently, we have seen some projects like ICD, these border, uh, border clearances projects picking up. And these are like laggards. They, these have been in plan for a long time. And slowly after this, the Modi government came in, it's kind of uh, we need to accelerate things. So they made really improvements on that one. Similar with the Chinese one, the construction, reconstruction projects. Chinese were the first ones to hand over a lot of uh, uh, reconstruction projects to the Nepalese government. So they too want to deliver. The Chinese ambassador is really aggressive in terms of pushing the private sector, private investors from China to complete the projects on time. So, Chen, two questions. The first one is, why this puzzle of why have the Chinese not been able to proceed with these big projects? We had a president visiting last year. Mm -hmm. As far as I've seen in the neighborhood, whenever you had a presidential visit, and this was the first maybe ever in a long time, uh, you've had announcements of big projects which have been announced in the sense they're going mm -hmm. into construction mode. We've been hearing about you know Nepal pitching 12 projects under the BRI. We've actually heard about Beijing saying scale it down to three or four. Yes. Why has this happened? First question. Second question, to, s to fill that gap you mentioned, there's a diversity of actors beyond China and India. You mentioned the ADB, 
The AIIB had its first loan, I think, to Nepal last year for a project on solar or energy, I think. Uh, but also I'm thinking of the European Investment Bank, which is looking for new sources, uh, for new destinations for European investment. Uh, MCC is also there, and there'll probably be benefits, obviously, for American companies. Mm -hmm. So what is the strategy in Kathmandu on that second account in diversifying the, the ah. pot and attracting new investments? Yeah, on the first one, um, the reason why projects haven't picked up, it's not, the, the reasons are not uh, uh, typical to Chinese, you know, Chinese investors initiated projects. The same thing with Indian initiated projects, except for the government-backed project, like Shotlas is doing Arun 3. I mean, it was 100%. We knew funding was guaranteed by the government. So it went ahead. But for the GMR, Upper Kamalia, it's really hard for GMR to financially close the project. Right? So they secured the commitments way back, a decade back. The same story with the Chinese. I mean, so it's, no, it's not different. So we should not really see much difference in terms of it, it's inherent to Nepal. The problems are inherent to Nepal rather than investors, right? We tend to give projects that are not ready. We think they are so ready, but from uh, investors' pros perspective, even feasibility, pre feasibility study is not done. So for uh, for Nepal, if you go and talk to bureaucrats and investors, pre feasibility study, they, they kind of project it as it's done, like DPR is done. And, but that's you was scratching the surface. You so much things needs to be done beyond pre feasibility. So it's it's I think the problem is within rather than outside. Amazing. Right? So China yeah. has failed in Nepal. That's a pretty big achievement <laughs> in this region. The last 10 years they've done Myanmar, they've done Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. Bangladesh has stalled it. That's actually a different story we should discuss at some other point. Mm -hmm. But interesting Nepal, you're saying it's inherent. And the second issue, diversification. Second, diversity, yeah. I think we need to diversify in, in the sense that uh, uh, we have reached a stage where our uh, fiscal deficit has grown so much. If we were a fiscally surplus country in 14, 15, now the fiscal deficit is around like seven, eight percent, nine percent. How you compute it, right? Conservatives like seven percent of GDP, and that's going to grow further. And and if you look at, we are paying interest and principal close to around two point two to two point five percent of GDP, right? And and that is going to grow more. And it's like negligible three four years ago. So that thing has gone like it, it has a balloon. And for that. Because we are taking um, a blend of a little bit higher than com uh, co concessional, but, um, uh, but lower than commercial rates. With AIIB, is that kind of uh, interest rate they, they offer. But then, uh, but then ideally, what Nepal needs to, to depress all this interest payment is like Jaiga kind of loan, where you actually get a, a loan for at least 0.01 interest for a capital project, like huge project. And, you, and the maturity period uh, is like 40 years. And then you pay back after like grace period is like 15 years, 7, 15 years. That is a sweet deal. <laughs> if you actually compute inflation, that's a free money at the end, isn't it? If you mm -hmm. compute inflation as like 40 years, it's free money. So uh, we need to diversify on, on those funds. Are those sweet deals still available these days? Yeah, yeah of course, yes. it's uh, available. But the only thing is, is Nepal ready to give that kind of project? Right? Uh, do, uh, do, we have enough do we have enough projects in the project bank to give it to the investors? No, but in terms of political horizon of decision making, you want development immediately, right? I mean, that's any, in any electoral democracy, that is imperative, right? And Nepal is becoming a more competitive democracy now. So the interest will be for sweet, bitter deals, or actually bitter deals at the end, but that seem very sweet at, 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 at the initial point of view. It's very difficult probably to sell a project that is a long-term project, right? It's going to take a longer time. Uh, do you see that debate playing out? China, quick buck, good project coming in, and let's keep the others out no, because as they're... I, as, I, as I said before, the so Chinese are more interested. No, not interested. Apart from a lot of restaurants and things in Tamil, uh, these are small-scale investments coming like Chinese, uh, but these are not really pushed by the policy banks of China anyway. Right? It's coming on their own. Uh, on their own. But mm, the Chinese, as with any other investor from any other country, are doing big projects and it takes time. So there is no quick win. There are no low hanging fruits in terms of big projects that you can pluck in. Um, uh, the only thing is how do, you, how do you lower the fiscal burden of a loan that you actually secure from a third country? Uh, and is there any, are there any option for the same project? We can actually get a cheaper loan. So I think debate should be there. 
right? Not not that with the Chinese would. The Chinese want to give a loan equivalent to Jai. I mean, it's good for Nepal. It's good for us. Debt burden is low, right? Uh, but the thing is, every country has their own procurement system, and they have their own intricacies on the bureaucracy. So Nepal's bureaucracy is not yet capable to actually wade through all these things and understand the intricacies. So. Uh, as I Sujeev said, like donorpreneurs, cartelpreneurs, everything starts coming. You have agents. A big investor wants to come in. You have agent coaxing the government and influencing cabinet decision before the respective line minister knows it. Yeah. Right? The, the proposal actually was passed. One of the hydropower projects initiated by one of the uh, northern neighbors was actually passed by the cabinet without the knowledge of the energy minister. I mean, these are the things that happen in the <laughs> town. Let's be clear. Uh, Akanji, you yeah. seem to be <laughs> nodding a bit in agreement, but. Uh, what are the also that political choices? I want to push a bit on that. From an economist, it's tough to get political <laughs> answers, but <laughs> you're very good at many things. But these are political choices, and we don't need to speak about debt traps, but certainly uh, there will be political choices of who you give out projects. Right. And countries have governments who have interests. India has its own interests. China has its own interests. Japan, uh, various alignments. Uh, how do you see Nepal is playing out? Is, is a debate happening? We see a lot of shrill debates in Kathmandu, right. but from your sense in government, other debates of positioning the country in the long term, escaping, for example, Nepal, I, in Kathmandu, many people tell me often they're very concerned uh, to become sort of a stomping ground for India and China and some type of condominium. There's always this paranoia about is Beijing talking to Delhi about us, right? When Beijing and Delhi getting along, which is these days decent, a decent relationship, right. uh, there's always that concern. So what is that thinking in Kathmandu these days from your vantage point? Um, I think uh, the panel basically agrees that Nepal has uh, now become very important geopolitically. It is, uh, it is at the right time. It, it can take leverage a lot of uh, advantage. We have huge opportunity. I'm taking it for granted that mm -hmm. we agree on that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a challenge for Nepal's uh, po uh, political leaders and Nepal's foreign policy. You know, uh, The fact that we have not been able to capitalize on these large scale um, uh, you know, support that is coming in a big way from China and, and, and also from India is, 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 the, um, is the basic foreign policy challenge. Can Nepal, for example, and I've said this uh, repeatedly, uh, afford to uh, move away from uh, India uh, without proper homework, for example, without proper preparation? Can Nepal maintain a kind of control over its uh, policies if it becomes a ground for too many players to be engaged mm. in. I think this is very, very uh, important. Uh, even BRI, for example, uh, the BRI negotiations have not been successful. Like you said, you know, China is actually pressing to, uh, to start very small. They're looking at smaller projects. It's the Nepalese government which is uh, uh, throwing uh, the bigger, uh, bigger projects, not in the, the, ne the past negotiation in last one year. And, 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 and we have uh, a lot of friends from think tanks here who probably would agree that BRA negotiations between Nepal and India, uh, between Nepal and China, have not been actually uh, very successful. So these are th this is one of the foreign policy challenges. Second is, like I told you, you know, a lot of thing is going to flow from the domestic politics and how Nepal is going to balance. And um, we have also not been very, uh, uh, you know, uh, true to our uh, commitments in terms of the Himalayan connectivity. Look at what has happened in BBIN. Look at Nepal's commitment on BIMSTEC. Uh, uh, BBIN, uh, uh, the last um, uh, meeting, I think, uh, there was no representation <coughs> from uh, the, the Nepalese, si uh, Nepalese side. BIMSTEC, you know, was very, very controversial. The Nepalese army actually walked out of a joint military drill. Well, you know, it's a different thing. I've questioned the rationale behind BIMSTEC doing a military drill, but that's a, that's a secondary uh, question. The most important thing is that that has happened. You know, the Nepal army, which is uh, which is which has such fantastic relationship with uh, the government of uh, uh, with the present government and also the Indian army, actually walked out of a, a military drill. It was a big, massive issue in India, and we we all have. Uh, spoken about it. So this is the uh, you know challenge for a smaller uh, uh, neighbor uh, for whom you know security and survival are going to be um, important. In uh, Kathmandu debate, and 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 this is obviously um, I, I have to say this is only Kathmandu debate. You know there are a lot of discourses in Nepal. If you move to the Tarai, the discourse completely mm, mm, ch changes. Absolutely. But yeah. in Kathmandu. The, the general understanding is if, if a smaller country is pushed to the corner, 
you know, then then we take then they take risks. Then that that is obviously going to be detrimental to its relationship with some other country, you know. So this is the Kathmandu <coughs> discourse. And actually, yeah, the terrorite is a lot of discontent with India of having been ditched somehow by India. I mean, there's a lot of different narratives yes. which go beyond beyond Kathmandu. Professor Lam, I have one very specific question, if you feel comfortable answering. But you were a nominee of the Eminent Persons Group. You don't have to share details or tell us where the report is. I will not ask you that. <laughs> but the Eminent Persons Group was asked by both Prime Ministers of India and Nepal to think for look backwards and think forward, right? Where has the relationship come from? We have a 1950 treaty which has speci specific prerogatives where India you know, comes out a bit stronger, right? Has certain rights over, for example, military imports, etc. An open border, which is an amazing open border, which is more open than most open borders these days, including, say, the US-Canada border and many other borders of which we think is quite open. Uh, you know, looking forward, do you think that what we call the special relationship between India and Nepal, it's a very special relationship, right? You can have, you have Nepali citizens serving in the Indian Armed Forces. You can have Nepali citizens serving theoretically in the civil services of India in certain ranks. So that is a special relationship between two states. But would you agree that a special relationship as anchored in the 1950 treaty is actually becoming a liability for normal India-Nepal relationships in this modern age where there's many more alternatives also for Nepal? Well, uh, mm, this particular uh, group of uh, eminent persons has been given a much, much wider mandate than the 1950 treaty. And so in our reports and in our discussion meetings across Nepal and in India, uh, we have discussed on issues related to trade, investment, to access to Vizag port, to Calcutta port, to other ports, climate change, to institutional, <coughs> uh, what you call it, uh, uh, capacity buildings in both countries, borderland developments, not the geometric line of, as a border, but the borderland developments and all. But on 1950 treaty also, we have had uh, several rounds of discussions and uh, whatever we had to uh, suggest, advise, we have already given that. But uh, during our uh, interactions on both the Nepalese side and the Indian side and, uh, uh, and, in, and our, in our confabulations with other stakeholders, it is quite clear that 1950 treaty has uh, worked very well precisely because <coughs> this gives uh, a kind of uh, unhindered access to Nepalese in India in terms of uh, employment, in terms of vigilance, in terms of other social issues in education, health and all. Similarly for Indians to do. So I think uh, that nobody really questions that spirit precisely because it is uh, man to man, it is institution to institution, government to government, and uh, it has, except few occasions, it has worked uh, perfectly well. But in, in, in terms of a number of issues like uh, cross-border environmental injuries, like the Koshi flood or the Kedarnath flood, uh, in terms of uh, sharing of water resources, in terms of uh, anti-social um, uh, activities, such kind of things. I think there are ways. But one of the things which we have uh, very widely discussed in our report is how to equip Nepal with second generation institutions. Now the one which we have been discussing here, not able to deliver good services, not able to meet this target, not able to negotiate, uh, you will find some kind of a classes of dreams between what one country thinks and one other country thinks about it. So one of the things which we have, particularly when you have a federal structure, and particularly when you have a, a kind of a long outstanding and to a large extent even uh, what you call it, uh, a history which has number of controversies in India's federal system, right? Despite that, we have had one of the best uh, federal movements in the country. And in what way this kind of federal structures or this kind of federal models could be uh, could be passed on to uh, Nepal? But see, I would also like to add at this stage that some of us who have been working on these issues, 
related to Nepal on Himalayan connectivity, environment, communities, and all, trade and all. I have had the opportunity to write uh, the Nathula trade report for the government and that uh, really facilitated reopening of the Nathula trade route after 44 years between Sikkim and Tibet Autonomous Region in 2006. One of the things which we have very clearly noticed uh, among the institutions in India and among the decision makers also, we really don't see about, we don't really want to see or we don't really so interest to see what is happening on the other side of the world, right? So for example, one of the very striking things today in China is uh, a water crisis. Despite the fact uh, they have uh, Yellow River, Huanghua to Yangtze to all kinds of rivers, there's a huge water crisis. And when I, I was in uh, Kailas Mansarovar Yatra just about five, six months back and I saw both the tributaries of Indus and Brahmaputra, Yalong Sangpo, they are drying up fast, I have had. But I was shocked to see some of these. When we traveled from Lhasa to Kanse to Sigatse, then to Saga, then to uh, Kailas, uh, the, the Mansarovar, then further to uh, Ali, uh, we found that uh, most of the tributaries are drying up, right, of both these crucial rivers for us. Indus and Brahmaputra and for us, not only for us, for us in South Asia. And yet we do not have a proper debate on what is what. Whereas when I see what is happening, you have this particular aspect on the one side, whereas on the other side you will find Chinese are uh, preparing so well about it. They have diverted Yangtze River under three phases, the west, the south, the, 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 the central, and the east, and in the east, they have taken 1,400 kilometers diversion river waters up to Tianjin, to Beijing, and to Shanghai under the what you call Green Belt project, and is spending about 80 billion dollars, something like that, in the very first phase. Now, if that, and we know that if you read Martha's report or even Majun's report on drying up of uh, Huanghuo the Yellow River, you'll find how they are coping up with it. But in case of India or in case of South Asian countries, even for Nepal, these are not major concerns, and right? Whereas these non-traditional security threats are going to be, are going to hit almost all the South Asian countries and more seriously a country, a, a country, a country like India. Therefore, I would say that in our report also we have we, well, we have not been able to go beyond what India and China, India and Nepal would like to do in certain areas like <laughs> development. But uh, in our discussions, we, the, all these issues came up from the civil societies, from the stakeholders, from the political participants that all these issues are need to be highlighted between uh, India and Nepal. I was just thinking of the wonderful uh, Iki Mod report recently on the Hindu That's Kush right. and the Himalayas. Mm. It's a fabulous report. It's online. You can download it. Uh, ICIMO, it, Integrated Isimod. Center for Isimod. Uh, Isimod, yeah. So in Kathmandu, they have a wonderful report on the Hindu Kush and the Himalayas. And they look at migration. Absolutely. They look at land uh, land issues. They look at, of course, climate change. They look at a variety of water, uh, energy, etc. Um, I think we'll open up to the to the audience. Uh, Suji, if you can come in now freely. Now we've debated you and debated yeah. what you've in many ways invited us to debate, and uh, and we'll take different uh, sure. questions and and open it up. Uh, yes, sir. Please. 